Um, I think it's on, isn't it, Jerry? Yeah, it's on. Well, that's good news if you've sinned because at least there's hope for you if you're willing to acknowledge it or recognize it. Uh, if there is anyone here this morning that's not quite sure, just come see me after the service. I'll help you with that. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 7.20 in the Old Testament says, There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Paul says, We've all turned aside and gone out of the way. Our mouths, our feet, our hands, our eyes, our minds, they're all turned aside and uh, we've strayed from God. And that was why Jesus Christ had to come into the world 2,000 years ago and... Uh, and die for our sins. Good Friday is almost uh, a contradiction of terms. Um, Good Friday. I thought about that the other day. Somebody said, oh, this is Good Friday. Good Friday. We celebrate uh, a day and call it good when Jesus died. Why? Why do we call it Good Friday instead of Lousy Friday or Rotten Friday? Well, it's because if Christ hadn't died, we'd have no hope. I've been a student of religion for a number of years. Many of you are probably uh, students of it as well in your own way. But down through the course of human history, there have always been only two responses to this issue of sin, whether or not a person has sinned. Some people, and many people in our modern society, are like the Hindus in the Far East that deny the reality of sin. Many people don't think they've ever sinned. They don't agree that there isn't any such thing. They think many people uh, that are teaching your children in school say sin is something, whatever you make it. It's, uh, it's, it's all up in your head. There's no, it's not real. It's, it's, uh, it's something that is a carryover from, from, uh, from the medieval ages. And, uh, you know, let's free ourselves from this garbage uh, from the past. There's no such thing as sin. Well, if there's no such thing as sin, well, we've got a hard time explaining why our society is so rotten. Uh, that's a little like denying that there's a such thing as pain or sickness to deny that there is such a thing as sin. But if you can convince yourself that there's no such thing as sin, well, you don't need a Savior then. You don't need to worry about having your sins forgiven. And so that is where many people are today. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. They don't want to believe in Jesus Christ because they've convinced themselves that there is no such thing as sin. And the Hindus believe that as well. That there is no sin in the Hindu philosophy and therefore there is no real salvation. You are your own savior from whatever. And uh, there's no resurrection either. You just come back. Depends on how you act now. You come back in the next life, either lower or higher on the totem pole. The other alternative to this issue of sin is people that readily admit his existence and they try to do something about it. There are all kinds of cultures today in the world that recognize the reality of sin. Animists in uh, the Far East, uh, and in the Pacific, the islands of the Pacific, there are all kinds of tribes, even today, that practice animal sacrifice. Uh, the Canaanites that, um, that lived in the land of Palestine, uh, before Israel moved in, uh, under the, in under the days of Joshua, they practiced child sacrifice for sin. Um, even today, Jews, Orthodox Jews, kill a chicken on the Day of Atonement. Did you know that? And wring, its, wring its head off and sprinkle its blood on the ground to sacrifice for sin. And that's very remarkable in so much as they've had Jewish prophets for centuries that predicted that their Messiah would become the savior of sin. And they rejected their Messiah 2,000 years ago. And they were the ones that were responsible in part for putting Jesus Christ on the cross on Good Friday 2,000 years ago. Well, Jesus Christ uh, became the savior of mankind. We Christians are among those people that view sin as real. That it's a reality that we have to deal with in life. And therefore, sacrifice for sin is necessary. Forgiveness of sin is a requirement. 
We need a Savior. We need something or someone to help us over our sins. We've got a problem, however, because neither uh, continuous animal sacrifices, like many people are still practicing today, nor the denial of sin are satisfying solutions for this business of sin. On the one hand, if you have to keep sacrificing animals to, get, to do away with sin, you, you have an insufficient sacrifice. Uh, it's obvious that your sins aren't continually being dealt with and there's no uh, lasting solution for your problem. And this is precisely what the Jews ran into. The apostle, whoever it was that wrote the book of Hebrews in the New Testament said that even in, uh, in Jesus' day, just after Jesus went back to heaven, there were still Jewish priests in the Jewish temple offering up Jewish sacrifices. The, the, the bodies uh, of uh, bulls and goats and turtle doves and pigeons and, and, and uh, lambs and so forth. They were still offering up sacrifices. They had to keep doing it. And he said, uh, what a rotten system. God is not satisfied with the blood of bulls and of goats. You may wonder why we Christians today don't offer up sacrifices. Why do we not continue to offer up animal sacrifices? Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ came to the world once in the end of the ages, the Bible says, to offer up one sacrifice forever for sins. And after he did that, he sat down at the right hand of God with his work is finished. And so that's the great significance of the Christian message, of the, of the message of the Bible. On the one hand, if you have to continually offer up sacrifices, that implies that the sacrifices themselves are insufficient. And to deny sin is unrealistic. Everybody knows they're a sinner down deep. You can talk yourself out of it if you listen to the right people long enough. But you've still got a guilty conscience and you've got problems. And one of the most unhealthy things to do in life is to run away from your problems to deny the reality of your problems. And lots of people are doing that today. Well, we have to acknowledge that sin is real. We have to acknowledge that forgiveness is, is a great need that we have. I think all of us recognize that no mere mortal individual is capable in his own power or her power to forgive sins. This is why the Jews got so angry with Jesus Christ when he came and, he's, and, he, and he claimed to forgive a person's sin. And these Pharisees started, you know, grumbling in their beards, you know. Who does this guy think he is? He can forgive sins. And so Jesus did a miracle here and a miracle there and just to prove that he, that he was who he claimed to be, that he was, was no mere mortal, but he actually was God in the flesh. So Jesus Christ proved that he was no mere man and that he had the right to forgive sins. Um... Today is Easter Sunday. For us, we are remembering the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ touches every area of our lives. It touches every subject. I didn't have to pick an Easter message this morning. Uh, we got halfway through Psalm 32 last Sunday. And I was thinking, you know, I wanted to finish that this morning. I wonder how the message of Easter ties in with Psalm 32. The theme of Psalm 32 is forgiveness of sins. Well, it's very obvious how Easter ties in with forgiveness of sins. For our sins to be continuously forgiven, we need a continuously forgiving forgiver. You need somebody, not just a man, but you need someone who is more than a man to continue to forgive your sins. And you know, if Jesus Christ died and stayed in that tomb 2,000 years ago, he hasn't forgiven anybody's sins. He isn't justifying you from God's curse. He hasn't given you salvation. All of this is one big hoax. You might as well forget it. If there is no such thing as... I might as well turn this thing off, Jerry. Is it, is it coming through? Oh, okay. Uh, if, if Jesus Christ is still in the grave, then nobody's sins is being forgiven. However... If he is alive and doing what he said he was going to do, then there is such a thing as forgiveness, and the, salt, the problem is solved. Let me read you a few scriptures from the New Testament just to show you the tremendous emphasis that the apostles, shortly after Christ raised from the dead, placed on the fact that he was alive and forgiving sins. In Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 39, 
the Apostle Peter spoke these words. He said, This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. David did not ascend into heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when the people heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brothers, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, Peter said, look it, Jesus Christ stayed, didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. And because of that, if you repent, you can have forgiveness of sins. If you want to be forgiven, you have to depend on Jesus Christ. He is the key. Over in chapter 3, verses 15 to 19, again, Peter was speaking. And he said, You people killed the prince of life whom God has raised from the dead, of which we are all witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. They had just healed the person whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him has given him, this man, this perfect soundness or health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it, that is, you killed Christ, as did also your rulers. But those things which God has before shown by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled, repent therefore, and be converted. Why? That your sins may be blotted out. If you want forgiveness of sins, you have to turn to Jesus Christ. He's alive. That was the point. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Peter and the other apostles answered, and they were in the supreme court of their land, answering for the charges of blasphemy and heresy. And they said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. If Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, there is no forgiveness of sins. There is no prince today. There is no exalted Christ today. He's rotted to dust, just like every other corpse. End of story. Turn to Acts chapter 10, verses 40 to 43, for another example. And these are the men that walked and talked with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. They knew him intimately. They saw him alive after his resurrection. And to these people, it was Christ that had, that had showed himself. He, Peter said again in Acts 10, 39, We are witnesses. We apostles are witnesses of all things which Jesus did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Not to everybody, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us, the apostles, to preach to the people, to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of living and dead. To him, to Christ, give all the prophets witness that through his name, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. There you have it again. This is like somebody beating Charlie Brown over the head with a bat. There it is, Charlie. You get the point? You didn't get the point? Over and over the apostles kept saying it. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead so that he could give remission of sins. In this particular case, he adds a point. Because Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead, God has ordained him to be the judge of living and dead. You know, what's the alternative to accepting Jesus Christ and having forgiveness of sins? There's only one alternative according to the Bible. You will be damned by the judge of living and dead. Now, if there is no resurrected Christ, there will be no judge. Have no fear. But if there is a resurrected Jesus Christ, and you do not believe in him and depend on him to have your sins forgiven and sin is a reality in your life, then you are going to face a living judge someday. It's as simple as that. There is a bite and a blessing to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you turn to him in dependence, you'll get the blessing, and if you don't, you get the bite. All right? 
and over and over. Acts chapter 13. The, uh, the Apostle Paul this time was in a Jewish synagogue. And uh, we'll just read his message. Verse 30, we pick up with what he says about the resurrection. But God raised him, Jesus, from the dead, and he was seen many days of those who came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses. We're talking about the apostles here. Who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, good news, how the promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled the same to us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again. And this was the fulfillment of the second psalm. We'll jump down to verse 36. For David, after he has served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. All right. So there is some of the New Testament evidence that the apostles believed in a resurrection and they tied forgiveness of sins intimately to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No resurrection, no forgiveness. If there is a resurrection, resurre uh, forgiveness is possible and failing that, judgment. Now, let's turn to Psalm 32. That's my first message, and this is my second message. Psalm 32 talk, talks about uh, the same business of forgiveness of sins. Let's read it together. And I would like to point out that the psalm falls into three parts. The first two verses is David's proposition in which he states his theme. In verses 3 to 7, we have his prayer in which he gives his own personal testimony. And in verses 8 to the end of the psalm, we have his precepts in which he teaches us about forgiveness. So in the first two verses, his proposition, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. The point that David's making here, and I won't belabor this this morning, is that it is possible to have transgressions forgiven. And if you're in that position, you're in a wonderful state. Uh, David is describing the happiness of a person who has forgiven sins. You know what happens to a person if they don't forgive their sins? Well, we, as we read on through this psalm, you'll discover how it affected David. It affects you physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, spiritually. It affects you in ways that you would not dream of and people that do not deal with their sins, God's way, carry the burden themselves. And it's too heavy to carry. There are people in mental institutions today who all they need to do is to get saved. I have a book in my library that's written by a Christian psych psychiatrist by the name of Jay Adams. It's, an, it's entitled Competent to Counsel. And his, in his own broad experience, having been raised in the secular institutions and how to deal with people with psychological problems. He says you can try behavioralism or psychoanalytic theory on them. You can try anything you want, but it will not work if the person's problem is merely sin. And he's run into specific cases where there were people that did something wrong and they were so guilt-laden with their sins that they retreated into some kind of bizarre behavior and people had them committed because nobody could help them and they were being maintained at somebody else's expense in one of these institutions when all they needed to do was to confess their sins and get right with God. And he explains situations where he's seen that happen. Personal real life testimonies. You know, it's much better to go around and I can vouch for this because I am one of these people and as I know many of you are this morning that live day by day depending on Jesus Christ. When I sin, I confess it as soon as possible. Get it over with. Quit carrying the, the problems. <laughs> Quit carrying the guilt and the hang-ups and the fears. Just get it over with. Give it to the Lord. And that's called blessed or happy. Happy is the man who has sin that is forgiven. We move on to verses 3 to 7, and David gives a prayer here. It's obvious that he is praying because he's not talking to me and he's not talking to you. He's talking to God. Let's read it. 
He said, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto you, and mine iniquity have I not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto you in a time when you may be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come near unto him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall compass me about with songs of deliverance. And the next verse, when he talks about you, he's not talking to God, he's talking to you and me, to people. Now, let's just pause for a moment and look what he says here. In verses 3 and 4, in his prayer, David is reiterating before God something that God knows full well, because God is the one that caused it to happen. He's describing the rottenness of the unforgiven state. Now, I've met people in this situation. Some people can hide it pretty good, and it tears them up on the inside, and they walk around with a plastic smile on their face pretending everything's fine in front of other people. But I have met people that can't hide it because it's too, it hurts too bad. And it's a rotten thing to be in the unforgiven state. David said um, that he remained unforgiven as long as he refused to talk to God about his problem. He said, when I kept silence, when I refused to open my lips and say to God what he wanted me to say, then my bones became old through my roaring all day long. Uh, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. We talked about this last Sunday morning. I'd rather have God's hand under me, supporting me, than God's hand on top of me, heavy on me. And if you trace through a few examples, if any of you have a concordance, you should run some examples and look up God's hand. And run passages where it says that God's hand was on somebody. Because whenever you, see, you find, I believe, whenever you read about God's hand being on somebody, God is squeezing the life out of them. <laughs> he's, he's trying to pass judgment on them. He's trying to get them to deal with their problem in turning to Him in confession. There are examples. David himself, the Israelites, Pharaoh. Old hard-hearted Pharaoh. We all can picture Pharaoh, can't we? I will not let the people go. Okay, Pharaoh, another notch. Right? And God's hand was heavy on Pharaoh. Ultimately, he killed his son. Well, uh, that's what happens to a person. That's what it's like being unforgiven. God's hand just weighs you down. Um, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Instead of being an ordinary person, you dry up spiritually. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's somebody that has got a study going somewhere is proving it physically as well. You know, that your body just dries up when you are spiritually out of fellowship with God. And so the solution to the problem is given to us in verses five, verse 5. The means to the forgiven state. Very simple. And this is in perfect harmony with what you read all the way through the Bible. Let's read it together. Psalm 32, 5. I acknowledged, David said, my sin to you. He didn't say he went to the local priest. He didn't have to go to some man. He didn't have to go through some ritual. It's as simple as opening your mind and your mouth to God and speaking to God. He said, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity have I not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This word acknowledge is perfect New Testament parlance. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you haven't memorized that one, you ought to. Because you'll use it more than any other verse in the Bible, I guarantee you. If we confess our sin, the Greek word for confess means to simply say the same thing as God says about it. Acknowledge means to say the same thing about it. God says, this is sin, I do it. If Once I'm to the point where I'm willing to say, I agree with you, Lord, what I did was sin. I sinned. When we say that, when we acknowledge that, when we come into harmony with Him about that issue, then that's confession. That's what confession consists of. Confession doesn't consist of some posture. You don't have to get, you know, in some contortion somewhere. Folded hands is not the, is not the means to forgiveness of sins. 
You can hurt yourself with folded hands. That's being sarcastic. Um, if you want to be forgiven, you have to acknowledge your sin. Let's talk to God about it. See, David said that the same thing, to acknowledge his sin was the same thing as not trying to hide your sin anymore. And that's ridiculous anyway. You can't hide your, hide your sin from God. It's impossible. Wherever you go in the world, he's there already. Talk about Big Brother. Um, Proverbs 28.13 uh, is one verse that indicates that. Solomon said, He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. You try to cover your sins and you're going to be in a rotten situation. So what you've got to do is uncover them. I mean, God knows them anyway. He searches your mind and your heart. And so if you want to be in a right relationship with Him, the way to get back into fellowship and to be forgiven is to just adjust yourself to God's position. He says, this is wrong, agree with it, say it. David goes further. He says, I didn't just do it in the past. I acknowledged, and everybody should remember that was here last week, that the historical background of Psalm 32 is when David committed murder and adultery and blackmail and a whole bunch of other things back in, was it 2 Samuel, Second Samuel chapter 10 and 11. David was one of the greatest of Old Testament sinners. Very few guys got away with what David... He didn't get away with it, but I mean survived what David did without getting killed by God. David was a really rotten guy. But you know something? The Bible says he was like... He, was a, he calls him a man after God's own heart. Isn't that amazing? One of the worst people that you can imagine, God calls him a man after God's own heart. Why? Well, because David was quick to acknowledge his sin. Now, in that particular instance, he waited nine months, and he dried up. And it was the worst nine months of his whole life, trying to keep people from realizing that he had impregnated some other man's wife, and he was trying to cover up his sin, and he had killed the man in the process to try to keep anybody from finding out. And God just blew the lid right off the thing. He said, you sinned in private, David. I'm going to show everybody what you did. And you know, this is no different in our case. <laughs> if you... Remain stubborn about your sin. If the same thing applies to me, you know what God's going to do? 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says that when Jesus Christ comes back, He's going to take the lid off everything and manifest everything about your life to everybody in the universe. Everybody's going to see you, what you are really like. How do you like that? I don't like it at all. And so what I'm going to do to keep that from happening is to confess my sin and when you know what God does to confess sin? He removes my sin from me as far as the east is from the west. He puts it in the deepest sea. He buries it and remembers it no more. If you're willing to confess it, he'll get rid of it forever. And you'll never hear about it again. But if you cover your sin and refuse to acknowledge it, you may get away with it down here, but someday you are going to be ashamed when you meet Jesus Christ. Now, those are pretty black and white options. And I think I know what you want to do about it. So, that's what David did. He said, not only did I do that in the past, but he says, I will, I will, <laughs> I will confess my sin to the Lord. He determined then and there that it was going to be a lifelong habit. All right? I will. And you know, in one breath, David finishes off verse 5 and he said, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That's the way it works. You open your mouth, and God erases the slate. Again, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess, the condition lays on us. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He wipes the slate clean at the instant we confess our sin. Now, that's how you get into the forgiven state. The benefits of being in a forgiven state are described in his prayer in verses 6 and 7. And David was speaking from experience because he had already gone through this thing and there's nobody that ever um, knows the peace and the joy of being forgiven who has never been forgiven. But once you're forgiven, you know it. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Let's read it. The, uh, the security of the forgiven state in verses 6 and 7. For this shall everyone, not just me, but everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when you may be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come near to him. 
Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. First of all, in verse 6, David says that for this shall the godly pray unto thee when a time when you may be found. For, for what? What has he been talking about? He said, for this shall everyone that is godly pray to you. For this. For this what? For forgiveness. He's been talking about being forgiven and blessed all the way through this thing. And if you're a godly person, if you're a believer, you can go to God at any time. No restrictions. You don't have to put gas in your car. You don't have to pick up the telephone. There are, it's easy. You talk to God. See? And that's one of the blessed things about being in the forgiven state is when you get out of it, if you're a godly person, you can go to God at any time. Any time. Any time. Any time. I do it ten times, a hundred times a day. It's been a while since I did it a hundred times a day, I have to confess, but, you know, at least a dozen. You know, I mean, that's about average, <laughs> I think, for the ones I'm conscious of. Right? At least a dozen times a day for me. You know, Hebrews chapter 2 just says that this is why Jesus Christ came to the world. Verses, Hebrews 2.17 for this cause, Christ took upon himself a human body so that he would be a faithful high priest that we could come to him for help in time of need. Same thing in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. We do not have a high priest that is untouchable, unapproachable. He's a human being, and he came down here and identified with our experience. He knows exactly what life is all about. He was tempted just like you and me in every area of our life, except he never did it. He never yielded. And so we can come boldly to him in time of need. That's what David is talking about. The privileges of being in the forgiven state, the security of it is that it's there 24 hours a day. God had the first 24-hour service. He beat anybody else to the idea. Right? And secondly, the other side is that the godly need have no fear of judgment. When he talks about the floods of great waters coming in on a person, he says, this will never happen to me. Floods of great waters is a euphemism. It's a figure of speech for God's damning, condemning judgment. And there's no better illustration than the days of Noah, right? I mean, the euphemism is based on a literal situation. In the days of Noah, how many people survived? You know your Bible trivia? Eight. Eight humans. That's a pretty small minority. God doesn't work with the majority. He works upon the majority, but he doesn't bless the majority. He offers salvation to the majority, but only the minority gets saved. Jesus said that. There are two ways, a broad way and a narrow way. Right? Many people go in the broad way, Jesus said. But then the, the narrow gate, very few go in the way that leads to life everlasting. It's, it's hard for us to understand how it is, but you know, God gives everybody in this room the opportunity this morning. And the only reason that you don't end up on the narrow way with your sins forgiven is your fault. He gives you the opportunity to turn to Christ. Well, you need have no fear of great waters of judgment. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. New Testament, Old Testament dovetail perfectly. Great security in being forgiven. And then as David says in verse 7, he gets back to his own personal experience. He says, really, if you're in a forgiven state, God is your constant source of security. It's a personal thing. You know, if you were to take away my family and my possessions and my health and everything I own, my freedom, and put me in a hole somewhere, there would be one thing I would still have. And I've read personal testimonies of men that had experienced this. Christian men. They're... Their unsaved friends, you know, beat their heads against the wall until they kill themselves, commit suicide. But Christians can survive anything because Jesus is there. We have the Lord. He never, you know, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, Jesus said. Jesus, Paul, David said here, you are my hiding place, Lord. You will preserve me from trouble. You shall compass me about with songs of deliverance. That is one of the blessed things about being in a forgiven state. The Lord is with you. There is perfect harmony. The unforgiven state, sin separates you from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. There's only one thing that breaks fellowship, and that's sin. Right? Now, we move on to David's teaching in verses 8 to the end of the psalm. 
precepts that he gives to us about forgiveness. In the first, in verses 8 and 9, the first two verses here, he discusses, he, he wants to teach us something about the prerequisites to the forgiven state because a lot of people need to understand this. They need to be taught it. It doesn't come natural. David says, I will instruct you people and teach you in the way which you shall go. I will guide you with my eye. Be not like the horse or like the mule that have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. My kids got an illustration of this yesterday. We tried to ride the horse. And Duke is a hard-mouthed, stubborn old mule. <laughs> He's just a, a goof. He was real nice, you know, until you turn him around to come home, and then he wants to go 80 miles an hour. And I had th two little kids and me on this horse. And, you know, it's uh, a stubborn, dumb horse. And that's the kind of illustration that God uses to describe people. You and me are like this. Down deep, we're like that. Did you ever take a good look at yourself? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Uh, David says, I need to teach you people something. I've got experience. I'll lead you in the way you should go. Don't be like the horse. Basically, what he's saying is don't be so stubborn. You need to be taught something about forgiveness. And the very fact that all of you sat through this without leaving like Dan is uh, <laughs> means, that, uh, means that you maybe learned something this morning about forgiveness. You've been introduced to some basic things about your having a, an ongoing relationship with God. Uh, the fact that he says, I will instruct and teach you means that we need it. It doesn't come natural. You have to take God's word for it. You know, people that will not listen to God on any subject are like horses and mules. And they'll never be forgiven. I can give you an example of that from the New Testament. In Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul and, and his colleagues were going through uh, some cities in Asia Minor. And they came to this one spot. And... After preaching his message on Christ rose from the dead so that people could have forgiveness if they believe, he went on to say, Beware, verse 40, Therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets, behold, you despisers and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no way believe, though a man declared unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them. Verse 45, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spoke against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Some people won't take it. Some people won't take it. They will stop their ears by talking to their friends or doing something else or arguing with you or saying, don't give me that cock and bull stuff. They've shut their ears. They're unteachable. And a person that is unteachable will never be forgiven because they will never listen to what God says has to happen before you can get it. It only makes sense. Okay, let's finish off with verses 10 and 11. Somebody told me to quit early, so I'm going to quit five minutes early today. Uh, verses 10 and 11. In his last teaching to us, uh, David describes the privileges of the forgiven states. The prerequisites are you have to list, least listen to God, and the privileges are obvious in verses 10 and 11. And to highlight the privileges, he just gives us a bit of contrast to start with. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. You want a rotten life? Ignore what I'm saying. Go ahead. Live your own life. Don't worry about God. Don't worry about sin. Pretend it doesn't exist. Talk yourself out of it. Pretend that it's all psychological, that there's no such thing as sin and guilt. All right. You do that, and you'll be nice and unhappy for the rest of your life. You will. In contrast to that, David says, But he that trusts in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. And this is the only time the word mercy occurs in the psalm. Mercy. You know, mercy is one of those things that you can't buy with money. Mercy. You know, if there's one thing that a criminal likes to see in a judge, it's mercy. Mercy. Right? Um... Lamentations 3.22 says that every morning the Lord's mercies are new. Every morning. Ephesians 2 verse 4 describes God as being rich in mercy. 
But you know, God doesn't offer mercy to people that are hard-nosed and rebellious. But to a person that just turns the least towards him, like David did. David had done everything that deserved to be capital punishment under the Jewish culture. Murder and adultery and deception and lying and all this kind of stuff. On every account, he was, you know, murder, uh, uh, death, 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 death. So he turns to God and say, casts himself before God. And he said, Lord, I need mercy. And a person that turns to God like David turns to God, you will survive. And more than survive, you'll abound. God can do things in your life that no man can do for you. He'll give you mercy. Mercy shall compass him about. It'll chase you down the road. Verse 11, be glad in the Lord, therefore. You know, all you people are either half asleep or wishing I would quit, and I am going to quit. All right? You can be glad for that. But you know something else you can be gladder about? Don't be sad. Be glad. Be glad in the Lord. Think about that the next time you get depressed over some thing that doesn't really matter in life. Just think about what you really deserve. And then say, Lord, I know what I really deserve. Help me think about that. Okay? Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous. And shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Now I was going to try and experiment, but we won't make you shout for joy this morning. But would you try that in your prayer life? Would you talk to the Lord and be a little more enthusiastic about it today? Lord, thank you so much for your mercy. Well, forgiveness is a great thing, you know. And if Jesus Christ isn't alive, remember, there is no such thing. This is all a bunch of bull. <laughs> but I don't believe that Jesus Christ is dead. I believe he's alive. And since he's alive, there is forgiveness. And why remain unforgiven? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thanking you that you are alive, thanking you that you are the risen Savior, the one who is rich in mercy, offering salvation, justification, forgiveness, and cleansing. Father, I pray that you would help us to experience this one significant aspect of Christ's resurrection in the coming days, that we would focus on it, that we would practice it, that we would be mindful, consciously of it, that Jesus is alive and he's waiting for me to say, Lord, I sinned. And he wants to cleanse us and forgive us. Pray that you would help this to go with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.